Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and today we are going to clear the air a bit about UPC codes, specifically the GS1 certified ones that you know I believe that you should have, but we have an expert here today to talk about that. So I can't wait for her to join us, but for right now, I want to remind you of what we have going on. I want to personally invite you back to the Confident Wholesale Bundlers Workshop. We are going in person in August in conjunction with the ASD uh, Marketplace in Las Vegas. I would love to have you there. Remember, Friday night, it's a meet and greet party. We're going to have um, cocktails and appetizers and meet one another and really prepare for the work that we're going to do on Saturday because on Saturday we are going to build bundles together. You guys are going to just learn so many things. There's so many breakthroughs that happen when we get together in person and I'm just really excited about that. Now that things are kind of coming back online and people are going back out and into the world. I would love to be able to meet y'all face to face. And then of course on Sundays that optional trade show walkthrough if you really want to walk through a trade show and have an expert at your side to help you ask questions, answer questions and get these accounts established so you can start buying product for your bundles, then I would love to have you there. Mommyincome.com slash workshop. It's going to be August 21st and 22nd, 20th, 21st, 22nd. Yeah, that's right. Uh, only 24 spots available and many of them are gone already. So for my savvy podcast listeners, you have an opportunity to get uh, a couple bucks off. So go to mommyincome.com slash workshop with the code workshop 50. And I would love to join you and see you there in person. So now we are going to get to our special guest. Please welcome Michelle Kobe to the show. Michelle, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It's really great to be here, Kristen. Well, tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Um, I am Michelle Covey. I lead our partnerships team um, at GS1 US, but I also do a lot of um, advocacy and evangelism for some of the GS1 standards that many um, Amazon sellers use, um, primarily that barcode or that UPC code or G10. I uh, will explain some of those differences that um, sellers do um, uh, assign to their products. Awesome. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about those things to clear the air about that because I think a lot of Amazon sellers that are new to bringing products to the table, especially my bundlers, um, they might not know the difference between a G10, a UPC, an EAN. What are all these codes, Michelle? <laughs> I know. So we get that question a lot. So. Um, they're, they're often used interchangeably, but there are very big differences between what a barcode is versus the G10 versus, and then the, the EAN and UPC. So let's break it down a little bit for you. Um, the barcode is the thing that most people recognize on their products when they go to a retail store. It's that the, those little lines on your product that are scanned at the point of sale and they go beep. That barcode is actually um, encoded with a G10. So the G10 is the actual string of numbers that uniquely identify that product. So the G10, which stands for global trade item number, is the actual string of numbers. And that number is the um, could be um, either a 12 digit or a 13 digit, depending on which um, region uh, sellers do license their their um, their G10 from. So GS1 US um, traditionally licenses the 12 digit, which is commonly referred to as the UPC. Um, and that UPC um, A is um, encoded into the barcode. Um, many times you'll see the EAN um, and that's usually um, licensed out of European areas. That's the 13 digit G10. Um, and those are used, um, like I said, usually um, administered out of some of our um, re uh, uh, European partners. Um, but one thing I do want to say is these are globally unique identifiers. So they are used and recognized around the world, whether you get the 12 digit UPC or the 13 digit EAN G10s. Awesome. That's really good to know. And the, the whole idea here is that these numbers are, are your product identity. Is that, is that a fair statement? Exactly. Consider it like the license plate for your product. So it is very, it is unique. Um, they are individual and they should be I, um, assigned to a unique product. So if you have different variations, each variation has a different G10 assigned. Okay, I have a quick, quick question about that. Um, what there's there's been some confusion about these specific codes. And for example, here's like Hot Wheels. Hot Wheels comes out with these tiny little cars all the time, and many of them. Uh, have the same 
UPC code or so we think. So can you talk a little bit about that and how companies are able to create variations yet using the very same code? Is, is there a variation or are we confused about what that means? So um, what we consider is if you do have product variations, each unique product variation should have its own unique G10. So I like to use a lot of apparel examples because people say, oh, I have a t-shirt. I have a white t-shirt. You would sign one G10 to it. But if you think about it, you usually have multiple sizes of your t-shirt. So you might have a small, medium, and large. So for each variation, you would need a unique G10 so that you could identify how many you have in that small, how many you have in that medium, and how many you have in that large. So in that instance, you would need three G10s. But what if you decide you wanna create um, white and blue also? So you have red, white, and blue, and you have small, medium, large. So you're going to need a, a unique G10 for each individual variation. So three times three, you'll need nine G10s for each color and size of that product. And why is this important? So there's multiple reasons. Um, so having a unique identifier allows you to um, identify exactly which item it is. So think of you as a, um, yourself as a consumer. When you go online, you do want that medium white shirt. When you order it, you don't want to get a, a medium red or you don't want to get a small white. You want to get that medium white. So having that unique identifier on that exact product allows you to, um, to, to really get that exact product. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for the clarity on that, because it really is important. I think a lot of people are creating variations specifically for use on Amazon, and they're kind of wondering, well, why do I need all these G10s for all that? So when it comes to our, our small, um, you know, bundle sellers who are maybe creating 10 or 20 different variations of something for maybe a season, and then those codes are kind of no longer. Is there a way to re-up the code to change it to a different product once it's registered, or is it kind of set in stone? No. So a couple of other, other comments too. Um, so to answer your question specifically, once you've assigned a product identifier to a product, you cannot reuse it. So um, because these products do live online and can live online indefinitely um, in different marketplaces with different retail trading partners and different channels, um, you don't want to cause confusion or collision um, with that unique identifier. So once you assign it to a product and it's in market, um, you should not, and uh, the standard standard is um, that you should not be reassigning it to a different product. Um, going back to some of the other variations too, and I think this is some of the work you do with your sellers, think about all the different variations of, of bundles too when you sell products. You could have one pair of socks, and if that's a, a unit that you sell, then you would assign a G10. But if you put two pairs of socks together and you sell it as two pairs of socks, that's another, and they could be the identical sock but pair of socks, but if, if you sell it in a two pack, then that would need an additional new G10 assigned to it. Think about, and then, you know, again, if you put it into a 12 pack or if you put it into a case, each sellable unit needs its own unique G10 assigned to it. Awesome, that's really, that's really, really important. So when, so product identif uh, identification globally is really the whole point here is making sure we use that. Now, we, we you know, I know you know, we, we, this controversial elephant in the room, right? A lot of people are asking, well, Kristen, why can't I buy a thousand codes for $10 on eBay or some of these other places that are selling these lists of codes? These codes are expired. People haven't used them in 15 years. Why can't I reuse these codes and what difference does it make? So we get that question a lot too. Um, so there's a couple of reasons. One, um, and specifically for Amazon, but many other retail trading partners, they validate that the seller who actually is providing that G10 information is that seller. So it's really for brand protection and seller protection. And so um, a lot of these uh, marketplaces and, and retailers, they check the GS1 license registry, which is our GS1 database of information, against, okay, here's the seller's name or the company name and that, that identifier, do they match? And so um, you're seeing a lot more um, of those validations being done. And it's really to protect the seller and to protect the brand so that you are um, really representing your company as it should be and not you know, counterfeit products or um, misuse of, of identifiers in the market. Awesome. That is super important. Now, another thing I want to, to let everybody know who's listening that 
way back in the day when I didn't know any better, I myself bought some of these codes and I listed my bundles with them. And I will tell you what the problem is now after, gosh, it's been probably five years since, since we've ever did that. We have brand registry and have our own codes and things now. But um, before I knew better and I bought these codes and we used them for you guys, hundreds of bundles we brought to the table. Here's the biggest problem today. If you choose to buy these codes that aren't registered to you and you list them on Amazon and then you want to make a change to that product. Say you upgraded something, maybe something was discontinued and you want to change the packaging or you want to change some of the components that might be in that bundle, whatever the case may be. If you want to update photos of that thing and Amazon all of a sudden says you can't make these changes because you don't own this product and you don't own this listing. So either A, it has to stay dead in the water as it is or you have to get yourself a legitimate code. So this is the problem even from years past. I actually had this happen to me about a year ago from a product that was I sold for a long time and it was a great seller. And one of the items was finally discontinued and I was going to swap it out for a very equal product in within my bundle. And they were like, sorry, you can't do that because this code is not registered to you. It was actually registered to some meat packing company that went out of business like 15 years ago. And so all Although the code was GS1 registered, it wasn't registered to me and therefore I could not update my bundle and that was a super bummer because I had hundreds of reviews, it was a great product and I had to start the listing all over again. So this is why we don't buy codes and even if you get through the door, you kind of slither through the back door with this code, you're going to run into problems if you ever have to update it. And let's be real, every listing needs an update in some sort, whether it's bullet points, pictures, anything that you want, um, you're going to run into problems. So this is one of the reasons why we want to have legitimate um, codes on our side. So um, what some people, some people feel like they're saving money up front. Um, but what it does to your point, it could end up costing you more in the end. Um, I know there's a lot of sellers that just sell on Amazon, but if you do um, expand past Amazon and into other retail trading um, channels, say like your big box stores, your Walmarts, your targets, they will require that G10 to be printed on your packaging. And so that, then you'll have to repackage, relabel your pet products. Um, it could cost a lot of money in the end. So it is, you know, it, a cost savings to come to GS1. And we've also now offered um, the, the UPCs um, at our single rate now. So hopefully that will help um, sellers be able to um, feel like they have better access to those identifiers that are more affordable. Can you talk about the pricing structure that, because I know that was a big deal to even that you guys added single UPC codes, because there's some people that are just literally launching one product at a time and they don't need multiple. So um, well, there's a lot of us who are very appreciative of that because sometimes we don't need, you know, a ton of them. But um, yeah. do, is there a, a specific pricing structure that is it, do you have to renew it every year? Is it single codes? I know they're sold in packages. Let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Sure. So at GS1 US, um, we offer, and we have for many years, offered bundled um, GTINs. So those have been our prefix um, and capacity base. So you could start at 10, 100, 1,000, um, and those usually come with a renewal fee. What we heard from a lot of, especially small businesses and micro businesses, we don't need 10. We just need one or two. Can you please give us some offering that will allow us to have just one or two? So um, last November, we um, launched that single G10 offering um, and it's at a $30 per G10 um, and there's no renewal, renewal fee. So once you pay your $30, that G10 is yours and it's yours um, for eternity. Awesome. <laughs> that is so, so helpful here because you know, there are some people that really only have a few products. And so they're like, well, what am I going to do with 10 G10s if I don't need them? Or, you know, as the packages go on. Now, what about, um, so, so I've heard that people have, this is just something I've heard out there. So maybe you can clear it up for us or whatever. I've heard that people have decided people with deeper pockets, well, I'm going to buy 10,000 codes and then I'm going to sell them because I only need a certain amount. So let's talk about that for a minute. So technically that's not um, something we we support, GS1 US um, supports. Um, again, it could run into issues with whomever is kind of taking those prefixes and, and um, then administering GTINs off of them. 
whoever does purchase them off of that um, will end up in the same problem as if you went and got your uh, UPCs off of another third party. Those um, G10s won't be registered to the sellers um, and they will run into the same kind of issues as if you did go to a, a third party. So not okay. recommended. <laughs> Right, I know I've heard that before and I'm like, no, they say I'm selling certified codes, this, that, and I'm like, well, like, let's really dig into that because I know a lot of people are just super budget conscious and they're thinking a hundred codes is $750. Like I, I, I could use that in a year in, in, in all the different products I bring to the table. Sometimes they're only being used one time. So um, the thing about the G10s that I think is really important for my listeners to understand is that um, it's going to be, previously, Amazon has allowed different people to, there's the different options for G10. So you can use an EAN, you can use the UPC, you can, those are obviously G10s, but then there's the GT, I always say GTIN, I don't know why, it's just shorter to say G10. The G10 okay. is, and it has an exemption. So they have previously have allowed people to have exemptions when you're bundling a product because oftentimes each product in the bundle has its own G10. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to bundling, now you're talking about a whole new product you're putting together based on the other GTINs that are there. And so when it comes to that exemption, a lot of people have been bundling with an exemption, although now it seems like Amazon is it's not an official policy yet, but I say yet because you guys know I'm always predicting these policies that end up coming down the line. They're starting to covertly like force this, that, that there's going to be no G10 exemption anymore. There's going to be get a barcode or get off. <laughs> and so go ahead. I can say for bundling, um, they have, you know, they're always, to your point, they're always updating their policies and always check Seller Central and, and their, their site for all of the, what they're doing. But I can say that they are starting to in, in, um, work with GS1 as an organization, standards organization, but also implement like how to um, assign G10s to bundles. So are they the same brand? Then you could bundle and, and, and then assign a, G, a unique G10 to like, say, if you're sh selling shampoo and conditioner, then you could assign a bundle. Um, there are some complexities if you start selling like a um, competing products. So I would say like selling Coke and, and Sprite or Pepsi together, mm -hmm. you know, they might have some, some limitations. I mean, they, they, you know, I think that there's some brand registry kind of things and considerations in there too, but they are looking at ways to um, really be able to identify everything that is sold on their platform uniquely. And so I think you're going to see some more uh, G10 requirements or, you know, requests for, for identifying those bundles. Absolutely. And, you know, this is what's so important is that I'm always teaching people. And so like it or not, live above board, live above reproach, live above what the, you know, bottom of the barrel is not how we want to do business and the back door and these different things. You want to be able to um, validate what mm -hmm. you're bringing to the table even if like we know the bundle policies right now are that you can brand you can bundle multiple brands in the same bundle that is allowed by amazon's policy however the g10 rules the exemption rules the brand registry rules get thing make things very complicated and mm -hmm. so what i always suggest to people is a don't sell big brands. You don't need to. They sell their own big brands just fine, and they are just doing what they need to do. You don't need to sell big brands on Amazon in order to make money. I do it all the time, and most of the stuff is very unsexy, and you probably wouldn't even know what brand it is anyway, and I bundle 99.9% .9 of all of my listings. Occasionally, I have one or two that I, that I sell single unit um, items, but for the most part, that is, that is not you don't go after big brands. You, if you do a Pepsi and a Coke or even a Pepsi and a Sprite or I mean a, a Coke and a Sprite, same company, different brand, different g -tins. you're going to run into issues. Why? Because Amazon is now more closely verifying who that g -tin is assigned to. And if it's not you, they're going to be like, why are you trying to do this? We're not yep. trying to make bundles complicated. We're trying to make them legit and valid. And they yep. are legit and valid if you get the right codes. Bottom line here, guys, you need 
to be legitimate because when you're legitimate, you don't have to look over your shoulder. You don't have to worry that you bought some janky codes that aren't going to be verifiable. You're going to think, okay, I'm, I'm doing business in a real way. And number one, you can be proud of yourself. But number two, you don't have to look over your shoulder wondering if you're going to get suspended or your listing is going to get kicked off or, you know, you're not going to be verifiable. Like cutting corners in business is just not worth it. And, and it ends up costing you more in the end. So you, you have very great advice. Well, thank you. Yes, I, I've had, you know, in the beginning, I get it. I understand. I didn't know any better years ago. And I was like, I'm just buying, you know, a thousand codes, this and that. And, you know, kind of got through the door with that for a time. But as things are evolving and changing, this is why I'm teaching people get a trademark, brand your bundles in a way like I have a bundle brand. And I know for some people, they're like, what is even a bundle brand? But it's my, I, I joke that it's Kristen's favorite things. It's not <laughs> actually that, but like the old idea is I am putting gift sets together. I'm putting accessory kits together. I'm putting things together that make sense that customers want to buy, but they're either generic or they're branded by a different company. And so Kristen's favorite things is this umbrella brand that offers only bundles and kits that people really want. And so that brand is bundled and has proper, you know, GS1 codes. I actually use EAN because before the single unit one, they were less expensive to buy. Is there any sort of difference as far as the EAN or the GS1 UK versus the US? Is there any um, discrepancies there? Anything we should be aware of? I think um, the one thing I could comment on that is there are multiple GS1 offices around the world. Um, and so we, you know, each uh, GS1 office usually serves that local region. So GS1 US serves the US market, GS1 UK serves the UK market. Um, we all administer um, the identifiers per the, the standards and the global standards. Um, and so really it's where you want to do business. And sometimes we also think, do you want local language support? Do you want local support? Um, when you have a question on your invoice or if you have member issues, um, so those are some of the considerations um, to take into, um, you know, things to think about when you go to the, the GS1 office to so, um, administer your or license your GTINs. Awesome. Now, quickly on the form that you fill out, there's been some questions people have asked about, okay, when you go, say you just pick a single code and mm -hmm. the things that they ask you, what are, what are the things on the form that they ask that you need to have ready to be able to register your code? Sure. So from the GS1 US um, site, if you select, um, you know, get my single GTIN now, the first screen will ask you for two, two fields, um, your product um, description and your brand name. So your brand name to your, some of the examples we use is the actual brand name that goes on your product or in your, you know, as your bundle. So don't think of it as your company name, think of it as the brand that you want to associate to your product. So that is your brand name. Um, then the product description, and we have little help bubbles that, that kind of explain the best way to, to formulate your product description, but your product description should have, recommended to have four elements, the brand name, uh, the net content, um, a, a description like a type of package. Uh, is it a two pack or is it a, you know, a case? Um, so some, there's some descriptors that, that should go into that product description. So those two fields then get carried into what we call our, um, the GS1 US data hub tool. And then those um, are what get shared into that global registry of uh, product information that can be accessed by retailers and marketplaces to do that product validation. So that's the first screen. The second screen is really company information. Most of the information that you, you provide on an e-commerce transaction. So company name, billing address, billing contact. And then the third screen is our payment information. So credit card information, that sort of thing. Awesome. That's so the good to have clarity there because I know some people are like, well, okay, so the brand name is Kristen's favorite things, but my company name is different. And so yep. which one is Amazon going to verify if they type in this code? And I think they match the code with the brand first and then the company. Is that correct? So there are some some variations and, and this is a lot of um, the proprietary scripts that Amazon runs. So I, I'm not, I can't comment on all of them that they they check against they do check the company name against the company name that you've associated to your prefix so um, i sometimes use michelle's cookies llc 
that's my company name, but my brand name might be Awesome Chocolate Chip Cookies or something. So it will actually verify your identifier, your, your G10 to your company name first. And then it will do some brand checks. It will look at brand registry, see if you have some, uh, inform, you know, have your product registered through brand registry and do checks against brand registry. And then from my understanding, and there's still some, um, some checks that they may do where they will, if there isn't an entry or a record with brand registry, they can associate the company name in the brand name field, but you have to change that before that ASIN is, uh, is created. Otherwise your company name ends up being your brand name and, and it's very hard to change it once your ASIN is created. Yeah, brand names are not, you cannot edit a brand name once you put it in Amazon. Amazon can, if you ask them and beg them like 150 times, um, if even if you make a typo or a mistake and they let it go through, they have to change it on their end. Because yeah. I think that was a common question people were asking was, well, my company name is this, but I personally have three different registered brands. So mm -hmm. with three different registered brands, can I buy a thousand um, G10 codes and then each one is assigned to a different brand? Is that a possibility? Yeah, your, your G10s can have different, be assigned to different brands. They all come into that umbrella of your company. So it's really where, you know, the brand that you associate to your individual G10. So, okay, so point. let me understand the hierarchy. So my company is um, Kristen's company, and then I have Kristen's favorite things, and Cookies R Us, and baby products over here. So um, they're going to match the G tins with my company name, Kristen's favorite things, and then my my specific codes are going to be registered with you know the cookies or the baby products or something else so those can be different with different brand names but then the whole company so that would be like i guess like procter and gamble owns tide so procter and gamble is registered with all these codes but then tide has one and you know yep. downy or whatever however much they own okay just yep. that was that was great clarity i appreciate that yeah we um, get that question a lot and and really, um, you know, as to your point, once your ASIN is created, it's really hard to change that brand name. So as you're entering the information, make sure it's, up, you know, you've got that brand name represented correctly, because to get it changed, it's, it's a, a tedious process. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So guys, if you're really out there, the, it's really to, to, to protect brands and pr to protect sellers, but um, it, it, it honestly, <laughs> honestly, that's what we want. We want protection. I think a lot of people, you know, people that are bootstrapping, people that have, you know, smaller budgets and they think about these things, they don't think, how is this important or why is this worthy? It's later on. We're front loading the work, we're front loading the investment because later on, it's so much less of a pain if you have to make changes because you own something. It's actually an asset. And y'all, you know, I'm always talking about assets. This business you're building is not just a little side hustle that you come and go when you feel like if you're building a legitimate business, it's a sellable asset. If you have GS1 certified codes and brand registry, you literally just doubled the sale of your business just like that because you're legit. You're above board. We're not like, well, we kind of slide through the back door doing all these other things. That's not a sellable asset. Your business is a sellable asset. So think about it in those ways, make the investments up front and just do the proper work. You will thank yourself later. Yep. Any final thoughts that you have? Anything we didn't cover that you want to make sure everyone was aware of about codes? No, um, I think we covered a lot. Um, sometimes it can get very complicated. We have some great resources on the GS1 US site. I think um, you'll provide that in the show notes, but it's gs1us.org. Um, we also have a YouTube channel, which has a lot of great short videos um, that help sellers just kind of break down what is a G10, how do I use it? Um, so we have some great YouTube videos. And then um, if you ever need to contact our member support, you could email them at info at gs1us.org. Um, so we have a lot of support for anybody who, who needs questions answered on uh, about GTINs. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here, you guys. I, that is gs1us.org. Uh, you can reach them on social as well. They're, they're 
uh, Twitter handle, if you've got any questions, there is GS1 underscore US. So you can contact them there. And of course, um, go to the website, look at those things if you want one code or 10 or 100. They have all these different packages. It's worth it. You will thank yourself later. And of course, now you have a barcode because the sky's the limit. If you can you get a barcode and a GTIN for your product, even if it's a Amazon bundle only, maybe you never know. Target and Walmart might be calling next week. So you never know. Thank you so much. Michelle for coming here guys um, if you want to join the Facebook group to hear more about these things connect with other sellers go to mommyincome.com slash join us the code word is gs1 of course you need a code word because we don't like spammers that's why so thank you again Michelle it's been a pleasure you guys I know you could be anywhere else listening to any other show doing any other thing I don't take that for granted thank you for being here on the Amazon files we'll see you same time same place next week thanks